choose where they're going to be, whether on campus or off campus, but the faculty are supposed to all be on campus. Well, uh, my, my brother says Massachusetts, he's, he's a doctor in Worcester, says, says you're down to 25 deaths a day, so we'll see. Uh, not quite. My, my newspaper, maybe he, maybe he knows a couple of days in advance, but the newspaper yeah. says that at, at where 50 are. Okay, well. But, yeah. Let's, let's, let's move on to something more, uh, more pleasant. Yep. So let's see. I think, uh, oh, it's nine o'clock. Okay, uh, I'll turn off my, all of my stuff here. Uh, so, uh, Andre, do you want to introduce our speaker? Yeah, I, I was going to wait a couple more minutes. Uh, people are still signing in. We, we should announce the schedule update yeah. as well. It's not, not reflected on the calendar yet. Oh, I got to go okay. bug um, Veronica. Okay, that's good. I will do that too. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll bug her. I've got the message. I, I already bugged her. Uh, do I have to say what I'm thinking? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, I think we can get started. Uh, so welcome to the second week of TASI. Uh, we have again uh, uh, four lectures giving uh, different numbers of lectures during the week. We have one, one big announcement, which is a change to the schedule, which we will communicate to you probably more than once. Uh, the key points to remember is that there's a particle physics strike scheduled for this Wednesday that we're supporting. So there won't be any lectures on Wednesday at all. We're still collecting suggestions on whether we should do anything on Wednesday. And if people have any ideas, they should definitely let us know. In What's order to make up for that, well, we will have uh, uh, makeup lectures uh, on the other days of the week, including one extra lecture by Martin Schmaltz uh, uh, today at 3.45 uh, TASI time. OK. So moving on, uh, we're very happy to have a Martin Schmaltz, who's going to be telling us about uh, dark matter. Uh, Martin is a professor at BU. He's an expert on model building, different aspects of phenomenology, and uh, BSM-related stuff. So you can ask him anything you like. He tends to be nice, so I, I encourage you to bug him, and we can test that. And uh, yeah, so go ahead. He's going to be using a Blackboard. So we're very excited about his experience. So let, let me ask a quick uh, technical question first. Can you, can you see the chat from uh, your setup, Martin, or would you prefer the students to ask questions out loud? Um, I am not seeing the chat right now. Should be a button at the bottom to bring it up. Yeah, I see the panelists chat. Oh, here's attendees. Yeah, so one comment is uh, all of last week, the students were asking questions using the chat. Mm -hmm. And uh, different people were handling them in slightly different ways, but mostly we were handling them in real time. For yes. you, that might be a challenge. That means you have to look at the chat every once in a while. Uh, could somebody just interrupt me um, when, when I I'm... can do that, yeah. Yep. Okay. I saw a hello. Good. So that's, right. that's, that was a test. <laughs> okay, very good. All right, so uh, let me get started. So um, I'm here to lecture on dark matter. Um, most of these lectures will be very basic. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, recent uh, model building in dark matter. Uh, people have been quite creative and, and I wanna give you a little bit of a flavor of that, uh, but we're not doing that today. Um, today, I want to talk about uh, dark matter basics, uh, the very basic things that we know about dark matter today. A tiny little bit about cosmology. I realize you have lectures on cosmology, but um, I need a few results, um, which we're going to go over. Uh, a little bit of thermodynamics and statistics in the early universe. Uh, how do you calculate number densities of particles and things like that? 
And then as the first big dark matter result today, we're gonna to talk about the WIMP freeze out calculation. That is, how do you calculate how much dark matter uh, you have in your universe? And so this is quite an ambitious thing. Uh, we wanna be able to say how much dark matter uh, is there from first principles. Now, my lectures, I have to say, are uh, heavily based on uh, previous people's lectures. And in particular, I want to point out Tong Yan Lin's lectures from TASI 2018. Her notes are written up in a really nice set of lecture notes um, with uh, you know, this archive number. So I stole quite a bit of uh, stuff from there. And Josh Rudeman gave some very nice lectures, which he didn't write up, but they were given at Carges in 2018. And his notes, if you poke around a little bit on the web, you can find them in handwritten uh, Josh Rudeman style. And so those are very nice. And uh, there are also videos of him giving those lectures again at the Israel Institute of Advanced Studies uh, this last winter. So I stole some results from uh, Tom Yan Lin or some, some uh, way of lecturing from her and from Josh Rudeman. And again, today's lecture, my second lecture today is uh, 345. All right, so let me get started. Um, so the first thing we want to talk about dark matter basics. So um, I don't want to review the experimental situation here, but uh, very base, at the very basic level, we know about dark matter from gravitational evidence. And so that gravitational evidence is uh, at multiple sizes or multiple length scales. So uh, first of all, historically very important was the galaxy scale and the galaxy rotation curves. So in terms of astronomers units, that's uh, 10 kiloparsecs is, is roughly the size. And so it's the dynamics of how galaxies evolve uh, just doesn't fit um, if you don't have dark matter, if you only account for the visible matter. Uh, at a larger scale, this is galaxy clusters. So these are uh, accumulations of, of a thousand or so galaxies. A galaxy cluster scale, uh, which is a megaparsec scale, <clears throat> Uh, we also have evidence for dark matter, and it's the same sort of thing. Uh, if you just solve the equations of motion, assuming only the visible stuff is there, you get all the wrong answers. And so we need dark matter at that scale as well. And then finally, and actually most precisely, uh, in cosmology, so generally cosmology, and in particular, the cosmic microwave background observations also require you to put dark matter into your model. And uh, so that is scales from about 100 kiloparsec to the entire size of the universe, which is about 10 to the four megaparsec. So on all of these scales, we have evidence for dark matter and dark matter being a gravitating thing. Um, it's moving relatively slowly um, and, and it's a gravitational source, and you can figure out how much you have to have, uh, how much dark matter you have to have by knowing how much do you need to modify the equations of motion uh, with the visible stuff by. So um, that brings me to the topic of, of you know, the, the equations of motion, and in order for, uh, for the equations of motion for the universe, we need to know the energy budget, of our universe. And the most precise measurements of the energy budget of the universe, most of that comes from the cosmic microwave background. And in particular, the Planck, um, the most recent data release of the Planck satellite that measured the cosmic microwave background. And uh, so Planck 2018 is uh, where these numbers are coming from. And so we know that off the energy, the total even or homogeneously distributed energy, so averaged over the universe, the energy in photons 
the fraction of the energy in photons is about five times 10 to the minus five. The fraction, so it's a, it's a really small uh, amount of energy relative to the other energy densities today. Uh, the energy density of neutrinos, interestingly, we don't really know because we don't know what the neutrino masses are very precisely. So uh, that is not a squiggly here, but we just have an upper bound. Uh, it's about 0 0.03. So it's very small. This is a very interesting thing to try to uh, measure more precisely and of course keep off. Uh, omega baryons. So baryons is basically all the standard model uh, stuff that is that constitutes matter, um, standard model matter, so, so hydrogen and helium in, in particular, are the biggest ones. And this is about 0.05, so 5% of the energy today is in baryons. Uh, omega dark matter, our favorite for these lectures, is 0.27. So about a quarter of the energy density is in dark matter. And the rest is about zero point, let me check my math here, 0 0.68. Uh, so about 70% is in dark energy or cosmological constant in uh, the Lambda CDM, the, the minimal model of cosmology that we have. So this is the energy budget. Uh, these things here should all add up to one. So this is the relative fraction, how much of what kind of energy uh, do we have? So how do we know all of this? Um, all these energies contribute to the equations of motion of the universe. And in particular, they uh, contribute to the expansion history of the universe. So uh, fundamentally, the way they measure, we, we measure these things is we measure the expansion rate of the universe as a function of time. So let me talk about that a little bit. So the expansion of the universe uh, works by there being a scale factor, um, A of T. So that means if you have a physical scale R, so some distance R, the physical distance, that can be written as A of T which takes into account the expansion of the universe as a function of time times R co-moving. And this is a distance uh, that moves along with the expansion of the universe. So, so or, or a coordinate system that moves along with the expansion of the universe. So you can think of it as a grid laid down everywhere in the universe. And as the universe is expanding, the grid is expanding with it. So these coordinates are in, on that grid. And if you multiply them by how much the universe has expanded, this A of T, you get the physical distances. Now, uh, to measure the expansion rate, you want to see the rate at which this A here is changing. So the expansion rate um, is called Hubble. And Hubble is a function of T. And it is defined to be a dot over a. And I should say a couple of normalization things. So today, uh, we have defined this a, the scale factor, in such a way that a of today, so a little not usually means today, uh, a of today is 1. And uh, from experiment, we have that the expansion rate, how fast the universe is expanding today, so that's H naught, uh, is about 67 uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec. So things are moving apart. Things that are one megaparsec apart are moving apart at 67 kilometers per second. Uh, that is the expansion rate of the universe today. So um, this expansion rate, as I said, is connected to the energy budget by an equation. And this is the famous Friedman equation.
And that is really the coolest equation in physics, I think. It is the uh, equation of motion of the universe. I uh, couldn't get any cooler than that, I think. Uh, Friedman, if you look him up on Wikipedia, by the way, uh, according to Wikipedia, is famous for having a moon crater named after him. It's on the far side of the moon. And, uh, uh, but I happen to think that uh, having the equation of motion of the universe named after you is a little bit more important than, than a moon crater. Also, if you keep forgetting how to spell this guy, whether it's I-E-N or double N or not, don't worry, the moon crater is actually spelled without the E and without the second N. So people don't seem to care very much how uh, his name is spelled. That's of course because he was Russian and uh, we're translating. Okay, enough about Friedman. Uh, Friedman wrote the following equation of motion for the universe. So h squared, the expansion rate of the universe, so it's an equation for a, uh, is 1 over 3 and Planck squared uh, times the sum over all the energy densities in the universe. And so this m Planck squared here, or m Planck in here, is 2 times n to the 18 uh, GED. That's the so-called reduced Planck scale, 2 times 10 to the 18, so not the uh, 10 to the 19 that you might be familiar with. There are some pi's that are different. But so this is the reduced Planck mass. I'll always be using this uh, Planck scale. And these energy densities here um, are, so these are energy densities. This is the fraction of the energy density in the different things. Uh, so another way of writing this is h squared equals h squared today, the expansion rate today, times omega lambda plus omega matter over a cubed plus omega radiation over a to the fourth. All right, so the, this is a, a nice trick to just take out the overall normalization. So the expansion rate today, uh, we know from experiment is this number, so that's this h naught squared. And then here you can see how the different kinds of energy densities uh, contribute. And uh, you know, I'm not giving the cosmology lecture, so I'm not going to explain that for very long, but, but uh, omega lambda here, this energy density in the cosmological constant is called cosmological constant because that energy density does not depend on uh, the scale factor A. So this is, uh, remains the same throughout the history of the universe. Omega matter uh, includes both the baryons and the dark matter. So uh, this stuff scales like one over a cubed. Uh, remember the universe is expanding. Um, so a is getting bigger. So, uh, and a today is one. So in the early universe, a was very small. So this term here is getting bigger and bigger the further back we look in time. So matter is becoming much more important compared to cosmological constant earlier in time. And we're going to be looking at A's that are as small as 10 to the minus 7 or even smaller. So this is an enormous factor. So early on, almost all the time, we can ignore the cosmological constant. And radiation uh, oh, and why is the A cubed scaling here? So A is the linear expansion of the universe, so how a length, one length expands. So if you have a volume that goes like R cubed, so that has three A's in it. So this is one of a volume expansion here. Um, and radiation, uh, so radiation is the photons and the neutrinos while they're still relativistic, so early on when universe is hot. Uh, so radiation dilutes like a volume, that is then a cubed, and there's an extra a here, and that extra a comes from um, the redshifting of, of relativistic energy. So if you have a, a photon, for example, and it has a certain wavelength associated with its frequency, so as the universe is expanding, that wavelength is getting expanded, so you make longer, the, the photon wavelength becomes longer um, linearly in A. And of course, the energy of the photon, which is the momentum of the photon, goes like one over the wavelength 
So the energy of the photon redshift is like one over A. And so, so we have a volume dilution as well as an, uh, the energy of each individual photon goes down. And so that's where the one over A to the fourth comes from. So Martin, we have uh, two questions from uh, people out there. Uh, one of them is, are neutrinos included in R or in M? Uh, so for most of what I will be talking about, so good question, um, it's uh, both. Um, so while the neutrinos are relativistic, they should be included in the radiation. And then when the temperature or when the kinetic energy of the neutrinos becomes small enough, that uh, you can approximate them as, as uh, non-relativistic particles, then the energy is dominated by, by just the mass, and then it's, they should be included in here. And so that, that effect that something is, this function here, this expansion rate is switching over from some small part of it, is switching over from this behavior to that behavior, is in fact what we're after when we're trying to uh, measure the neutrino masses from, from cosmology. Okay, good. That was the second question you were asked, which you have just answered, I believe. Ah, okay, great. So um, let me do a little bit of erasing. So what we want, so I'm discussing, you know, how do we know these different energy densities, and which is also kind of what I just said. Uh, we know that by fitting to this equation here, and picking off the terms. So what are the terms that scale like this, like that, and like that? And uh, so, yeah, I should show this plot. So um, just so you're oriented. So this is a plot of um, the scale factor. So uh, today is one. And as you know, the universe is ex as cooling as it is expanding. So equivalently to A here, I could also show you the temperature of photons or the typical energy of photons. So this plot also, this axis here is also one over the temperature of the photons. And let's make it a log log plot. Um, and here I'm gonna show you the log of the energy densities. And so the energy densities are these things here with an appropriate H naught out front. Uh, so, Today, which is over here, so this is now, uh, we are dominated by cosmological constant, that's the biggest, and cosmological constant is constant in time and in, in scale factor. Then if you go backwards in time, uh, omega matter is the next biggest thing, and that increases with uh, one over the volume as you go backwards in time. So very quickly, if you go backwards in time, uh, we get actually the dominant energy density will be the dark matter and uh, the baryons. So this is matter. Um, and then uh, at about an EV in temperature, well, let's put so EV as the temperature here, uh, the radiation becomes the most important. So radiation should scale with an even steeper slope going backwards. So this is radiation. So this is a to the zero, a to the minus three, a to the minus four. And so this is uh, because at this point, matter and radiation are equally important. Uh, this is called equality. Uh, matter radiation equality at that point. And then another important point is uh, at about an MeV. And so this is the point when Big Bang nuclear synthesis took place. So MeV is approximately, well, twice the electron mass. At this point, uh, uh, the, the light nuclei formed. So a hydrogen and neutron clumped together and made helium. Um, and, and a few other elements. So this is the earliest part of the universe, the earliest time in the universe where we have um, actual measurements. So we have measurements from BBN by just looking at how much of the different elements there is in the universe, the fractions of the different elements. That tells us something about the expansion rate over here. Uh, we know a lot about the EV scale, uh, which is 
coincidentally where matter and radiation are about equally important uh, because at that time the CMB photons are being emitted. And so by looking at those photons, we can learn a lot about this scale. And then of course the photons are traveling towards us and reach us today here. So from the CMB, we actually learn about all of these time scales here, um, at, at least some integral because the photons travel through the, all that expansion history. And so the integral over that expansion history is, is in the photon properties. Before this time, MEV, we know very little. We know that there are certain basic things have to have happened, but we have no real measurements uh, here. And so if you are a model builder in dark matter, uh, you will aim to always put your fancy model things in the earlier time here before MEV, uh, because you can do anything there. Okay, uh, so one more thing I wanna say about this very basic stuff is, and this is a number that we're gonna have to keep in mind. Uh, so this uh, omega dark matter here, corresponds to, so that dark matter today is about 0.27 uh, of the total energy budget. That corresponds to a density, energy density in dark matter today of about 1.3 uh, keV per centimeter cubed. So it's an energy density, keV per uh, volume. So this is in uh, you know, normal sort of units but in particle, normal people's units, in particle physics units with h bar and c uh, set to one, we would say 10 to the minus 11 EV uh, to the fourth. And so this is a number that I'll be using uh, again and again. So the energy density in dark matter today is 10 to the minus 11 EV to the fourth. So there's one question in the chat. Yeah. I can read it if you want. Yes, please. If we put every model before B, you know, BBN, then how can we constrain them and distinguish them? <laughs> a very good question. So yes, if you just want to make a model that's not observable, you put everything before BBN. Uh, if you do want to have some observations, uh, the some properties, some features should be leaking into this regime here. And, uh, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very fair question, actually. And, and I think it's also a valid criticism of some of uh, the dark matter model building that's happening these days. People are doing a lot of model building out here where the chances that we'll ever know whether it's exactly right are very slim. Similar criticism applies to grand unification models where people do a lot of work, or string theory, where people do a lot of work uh, about physics at very high scales that we will never uh, access experimentally. Okay, um, good. So uh, some basic other properties. So the density, energy density in dark matter today should be 10 to the minus uh, 11 EV to the fourth. We know that from experiments, from measurement. So if we're trying to explain how much dark matter there is, this is what we're shooting for. A few other basic properties that we know from these kinds of things. And basic logic um, it is that, well, maybe I don't need to write these all down. Uh, I'll write down some. So dark matter obviously should be stable. And if you think about it a little bit more, uh, it doesn't have to be exactly stable. It just has to be stable enough. So the lifetime of dark matter needs to be greater than or equal to about the age of the universe, a little bit longer, because you don't want to have a lot of it having decayed recently. So about 10 to the 11 years is uh, the minimum lifetime that you need to have for dark matter. Um, if dark matter happens to decay to standard model particles, visible particles, in particular photons, if the dark matter decay produces photons, then uh, you will learn about this in the indirect detection lectures. Uh, the constraint is much stronger than it's uh, the lifetime should be about 10 to the 17 years. Uh, another important thing that we know about the dark matter is that it's cold. 
And what we mean by that is that the velocity should be much less than the speed of light. In particular, in our galaxy, the velocity is about 10 to the minus three. So, you know, by car standards, that's really fast. But by uh, particle physics uh, standards, that's very slow. So the dark matter kinetic energy is very small compared to the mass energy, i.e. it's cold. Also, the dark matter, as the name says, should be dark. So the charge, if it has any electromagnetic charge, that charge should be much less than one, or much less than, than the charges of the standard model particles. And here, I mean 10 to the minus you know, 6 or 10, or it depends a little bit. Um, okay, there's another question, if you have a second. Yes. Says, uh, you've mentioned that this is all based on Lambda CDM. What are some of the other models and how do they differ from Lambda CDM? <laughs> uh, I'm not going to answer that. That's a question that you should ask the cosmology lecturer. Um, so in Lambda CDM, um, well, I mean, I'll uh, answer the dark matter part. In Lambda CDM, the dark matter is assumed to be uh, non-interacting other than through gravity and, and uh, perfectly cold. Um, so you could have models, and we're going to talk about that, where the dark matter isn't exactly cold. And uh, so then the residual motion of the dark matter uh, that you have because it has some temperature will change some of the properties. Uh, so that's one of the things. Or you could have uh, you know, the electromagnetic charge not to be exactly zero, but something small, uh, but big enough that, that it still does interact um, so that, again, would not be considered lambda CDM. Okay, um, what do we know about the spin? We actually don't, so if it's a particle, we don't know anything about its spin. It could be spin zero, it could be spin a half, spin one, three halves. So the spin, we just don't know, uh, which is fun for model building. So there's different possibilities. If you want to build a model, you can put scalars, you can put uh, vectors, you can put uh, fermions, which are my favorite. And then what do we know about the mass of the dark matter particles? So the mass um, is interesting uh, because we also don't know very much about the mass. So uh, here is a, an axis of all the possible masses uh, for dark matter. And let me put a plank on this axis. So particles with masses of order m plank uh, that's a dividing line. So if you're going this way here, it could be a fundamental particle. If you're going to objects that are bigger than M Planck, uh, these are black holes or macroscopic objects. Uh, since I'm a particle physicist, I'm going to stay on this side here of the axis. So my dark matter will always have a smaller mass. Up here, uh, you know, a popular candidate is, is primary black holes. Uh, I will have nothing to say, or primordial black holes, I have nothing to say about that. Um, it doesn't seem to work very well, but, but that's something that people debate. Uh, an important scale on here is 100 TeV. Uh, another scale uh, that's a little bit more arbitrary is GeV, uh, then KeV, and then finally, all the way over here, is 10 to the minus 22 EV. So this is the range of masses that if the dark matter is a particle, uh, what the mass of that particle can be. So these here between GeV and 100 TeV are roughly called WIMP. So we'll talk about WIMPs today and, and tomorrow mostly. Uh, this is called light dark matter between KeV and GeV. By the way, you know, different people use different names for that. And down here below KeV, uh, I'll call that ultralight or superlight or whatever you want, and uh, bosons. So as I will discuss in lecture three, uh, the lower KeV, those masses, that can only be bosons. Um, so here, if we ever find that the mass is this small, we know it's not a fermion. Okay, there's another question here. Yeah. Um, is simplicity the only reason we say that dark matter is a particle as opposed to many different species of things? Um, good. Uh, so the dark matter, uh, the answer is yes. 
Uh, the dark matter could, of course, be multiple different things. Uh, we know that there are black holes out there, for example. So black holes, by definition, therefore, are dark matter because you can't really see them, so they're dark. They're out there, they contribute to the matter, so therefore, they're dark matter. So what I'm talking about here is what is the dominant amount of dark matter. Uh, so if there's, is there one particle, I'm assuming, right, if you have many different species, all with different abundances, presumably one of them is the one that has the biggest abundance, that's the most important. So that's the one that I'm talking about here. But it could be that we have 50-50 of two kinds of particles, one of them with this mass, one of them with that mass, that would be a great coincidence, but possible. Thank you. Okay, a couple more questions just popped up. The first one is, uh, when people say bosons, are they almost always referring to axions or is there a larger class of models in the context of dark matter? Uh, they're almost always referring to, um, to axion-like axion particles. Um, I think you can do it with vectors as well. Um, also, let's see, why can't ultralight dark matter be fermions? Uh, we will talk about that in lecture three. It has to do with the Fermi exclusion principle. Um, another question, why is the lowest limit 10 to the minus 22 EV? Is that the lowest possible mass for bosonic cold dark matter? Uh, that is the lowest possible mass. Also, we'll talk about that in uh, lecture three. Okay, one last question. Can you elaborate on the constraint of dark matter's charge? Uh, <laughs> I will elaborate on that in lecture three as well. Yeah, all, all questions from now on will be answered in lecture three. Uh, so it's basically that if it has too much charge, then it can interact through photons with the visible stuff and there are bounds on how much interaction you can have. Uh, in particular, it's much less than that. So there would be Coulomb scattering with uh, ordinary um, protons, for example, and electrons, and, and there are strong bounds on that. The dark matter needs to be moving independently, other than through gravitational forces, from the ordinary matter. Okay, so I'm... Um, if there are no more questions about this. Uh, so I'm, I'm mostly going to focus on this mass range for now, but I promise you in lecture three, we will, lecture two, we'll moving this way, and lecture three, we'll talk a bit about that as well. Um, but so this is sort of the classic regime in masses that people are talking about most, and the reason uh, will be becoming clear when we're talking about uh, the freeze-out calculation that I wanted to tell you about. Okay. So, so we want to be able, and, and so the goal of the freeze-out calculation is really a very, very ambitious thing. What you want to do is you want to predict how much dark matter there should be in the universe. So if you think about that, that's, that's really ambitious, right? So we want to be able to say, given some properties of the dark matter that maybe we measured somewhere else, we want to be able from first principles, uh, able to say how much dark matter there should be and then we want to compare that to this number here, and hopefully we're right. Uh, of course, we already know what this number is, so we're going to go backwards and trying to design our dark matter in such a way that this works. But if we could ever measure directly what the mass of the dark matter is and some basic properties, we can make this check, and that's what's so cool about this. And it turns out this works best, or works uh, very nicely, uh, if the mass is, is somewhere in this range. Okay, so in order to do this calculation, we need to talk about dark matter in the early universe when presumably that dark matter got created. And, uh, and in particular, what we're talking about is uh, here, the wind thermal freeze out. That's where we hit it. And the idea there is that early in the universe, uh, the universe was, or the WIMPs were in equilibrium, in thermal equilibrium with the standard model. So the standard model particles plus the dark matter particles were some hot thermal soup, and they were in equilibrium with each other. 
So very early in the universe. Uh, more precisely, actually, what that means is that the dark matter from now on is going to have this name chi, that the dark matter has an interaction, this is some kind of scattering amplitude from particle physics uh, with standard model particles. And I already got this one. So my time will always flow to the right on the blackboard. So this is a scattering event where dark matter exchanges energy with a standard model particle. And this scattering here leads to what's called kinetic equilibrium. And there's another kind of scattering event. If you have this, you can also have that chi chi scattering into two standard model particles. And this one is called, so what's the importance? This one here allows you to exchange energy between the standard model and the dark matter, kinetic energy. And this one allows you to change the particle number. So you can turn chi's into standard model particles and vice versa if you go both directions. So this puts you into what's called kinetic equilibrium and that puts you into what's called uh, chemical equilibrium. So this is particle number change, this is energy transfer. So uh, from statistical physics, we know that particles in kinetic uh, equilibrium, so if you have kinetic equilibrium, then you can write a particle distribution function Well, the particle distribution function you can always write, but in kinetic equilibrium, it has a relatively simple form. This is the function that tells you how many particles do I have of momentum P. And that function is 1 over e to the energy minus so-called chemical potential over temperature uh, plus or minus 1. And uh, plus is a fermion. So that's the so-called Fermi Dirac distribution. And minus is for bosons, Maxwell, uh, no, uh, Bose-Einstein distribution. Okay, so you know how many particles, if they're in kinetic equilibrium, um, you know how many particles of a certain momentum, uh, of any momentum do I have? by just looking at this. So it's e to the, uh, the energy here, of course, is so e squared plus m squared square root. And uh, so the unknowns in here are the temperature. So if you're in kinetic equilibrium, there's such a thing called the temperature of your gas of particles. That temperature is an unknown function of time. And then you have this other unknown function of time, mu, uh, the uh, chemical potential. So in terms of these two unknown functions, you know how many particles you have as a function of the momentum. So this tells you the momentum distribution of your particles. And um, okay, now I will uh, actually post my notes. And uh, so in my notes, I uh, have a little argument that shows that if you, so if you have an interaction like this uh, with some kind of particles turn into some other kind of particles, the chemical, there's a, uh, this uh, gives you a constraint on if you are in chemical equilibrium, this gives you a constraint on the chemical potentials of the particles involved. And in particular, you can show that early on in the standard model, the chemical potential of photons and of uh, electrons plus positrons are zero. And uh, the, the relation that you can show is that the chemical potentials of the particles on the left-hand side is equal to chemical potentials on the right-hand side. And so if you have this process here and the standard model chemical potentials are zero, that tells you that the dark matter chemical potential is also zero. So in many, many cases that we're be going to be considering, when you're in kinetic equilibrium and also in chemical equilibrium, this chemical potential is equal to zero. So for now, I'm just going to set this uh, chemical potential to zero 
or um, you know, we could assume that it's just very small compared to the mass that appears in E here and the temperature. So, but in the notes, uh, I, I elaborate on that a little bit more. So this tells us if we have a thermal distribution of particles, uh, how are they distributed by momentum? Um, now, often what we want to know is not, you know, how many particles of which kind of momentum do we have? Uh, what we really want to know is actually uh, some more global property, like how many particles do we have in total? Or really, what is the density of particles in our universe? And also, what is the energy density? So if you have this distribution function here, you can get the number density the particles, which is called n, uh, by integrating this distribution function. So this is telling you how many particles do I have of a certain momentum, p, p appears in e here. And so I should just add over all momenta, and then I get uh, the total number of particles. So the number density is uh, a formula, let me write the formula first. So it's uh, some g times an integral over all momenta, we're in three dimensions, so integral dqt over 2 pi q uh, times that function f of p. Now, by the way, this is this f of p here is when you're in kinetic equilibrium. You can always have, you know, if you're not in kinetic, kinetic equilibrium, you can always write this function that tells you how many particles do I have of what momentum. In general, it can even de de depend on the direction of the momentum. So this formula here, if I had that function for all f of p and I sum of all momenta, that tells me the number density of uh, all the particles. So uh, you can see here, this is a number density. So this is a number of particles per volume. So this f here was actually not just a distribution function in p, but it was also a distribution function in x. So how many particles do I have per position, per momentum? And I've suppressed the x-dependence because I'm assuming for now that everything's homogeneous, everything is the same everywhere. But in principle, we should be putting in x uh, a space here and a space in there as well. Okay, so, so with that in mind, this is the number of particles per uh, phase space or xp space volume. Okay, there's another question when you have a second. Yeah. Uh, is the chemical potential of dark matter zero also if it couples only to quarks or massive gauge boson, bosons when dark matter and standard matter, matter particles were both in kinetic and chemical equilibrium? Um, you just said that the chemical potential of photons and electrons and positrons is zero in the early universe. Yeah. So when we are temperatures that are high enough that those other particles that you're talking about are in equilibrium with the rest of the standard model, there will be some similar diagram with photons and your favorite Ws or, or Higgses or whatever you wanted to do. And that will show you that the chemical potential of those things are zero. And then if the dark matter interacts with those, the chemical potential there is also zero. I'll come back to that a little bit more later um, in tomorrow's lecture, because uh, it's not necessarily true that the chemical potential is always zero. In fact, uh, after, you know, if um, your particle is not in equilibrium anymore, so this, this question of whether you're in equilibrium or not is going to be a time dependent question. So Usually things are in equilibrium early in the universe and then they decouple and become two different things that, that don't interact anymore because this interaction rate is becoming too slow and then uh, you can develop a chemical potential. Okay, um, so that's the number density and uh, G here is counting how many uh, uh, degrees of freedom your particle has. So for example, if we're talking about a photon here, 
This is the spin up and spin down the two different spin states of the photon. So G would just be two. If we're talking about the Dirac fermion, G would be four. If your particle has color, uh, uh, like a quark, then there are three different color states so that G also contains then a factor of three for color. For most of what I'm going to talk about is we're talking about orders of magnitude and we're going to assume that uh, particles, you know, don't have uh, some hidden color where there's a thousand different possibilities for the color. So we're going to take G's to be order one numbers, which I'm often just not going to bother with. So this is the number density. So if I know this phase space distribution function f of p, I can just integrate a dqp and I get the number density. And similarly, you can get the energy density uh, straightforwardly by doing a similar integral. Now I just need to count all the particles and multiply them by their energy. And the energy of a particle is square root of p squared plus m squared. So it's exactly the same formula. Uh, with an extra square root of p squared plus n squared. Inserted accounting for the energy of each particle. And so that will give you the energy density. Um, so this is kind of a hard integral to do. Uh, you can do it in terms of some kind of special functions. And I don't even remember what they're called, Hankel or something. Um, when this E here is a square root of P squared plus M squared, but it simplifies, this integral simplifies a lot. Um, so the angular integral is of course trivial because this doesn't depend on angles. So we just get a four pi, but the, the radial integral is, is more tricky. Um, but it simplifies a lot if we assume that our particles are either completely relativistic, i.e. we ignore the mass, or our, uh, our particles are very non-relativistic, the mass is huge uh, compared to the temperature here, right? So it's mass in here versus temperature that's important, uh, that, that governs the exponential that lives here. And so we can make these, let me write down the approximations in those limits. So relativistic is T, the temperature much larger than M, right? So T is the kinetic energy. So for a relativistic particle, the kinetic energy is just its momentum. And so the momentum much larger than M or uh, we're just going to set n to zero in the formula. So then you can integrate n here very easily. And there's a difference between boson and fermion, plus or minus one. So I'll write the two formulas. So for n boson, you get uh, some prefactor that uh, is some kind of Greek letter called worm uh, of three. I think it's a zeta. It's one point, another word for 1.2 approximately, uh, divided by pi squared, and then times this G and times temperature cubed. In fact, you could have just gotten this by dimensional analysis. Uh, if we're setting the mass inside the energy to zero, we are already ignoring the chemical potential. Then the only thing that this F of P here depends on is P and T. Uh, it's a number density, so it should scale like uh, one over the volume, or it, it should be a one over volume in terms of units, so momentum cubed or energy cubed. And um, well, we're integrating over P, so it can't depend on P anymore, so the only thing with the right units is T, so T cubed. So the number density of relativistic bosons uh, always is T cubed times some order one ish uh, numbers. So often we're just going to say n is t cubed for relativistic particles. So this was for uh, bosons or fermions. You get the same answer with a prefactor of three quarters. So again, doing squiggly math. The number density of bosons and fermions, relativistic bosons and fermions is the same. Um, 
for some idiosyncratic reasons, I'm always going to be dropping zetas and pies, but I'm going to keep track of the three quarters. Uh, I can't answer why I'm doing that. Okay, non-relativistic. So that's the opposite limit. In the opposite limit, when the mass is much larger than the temperature, so if the mass is much larger than the temperature, then that E here is necessarily always much larger than T. So this exponential here is always huge. We can ignore the plus minus one because the exponential is huge. And we just have mostly E to the minus M times T. And then there's a non-relativistic correction, P squared over two M, when you expand the E out in a small P over M, and then you, uh, that's a, a Gaussian integral, then, and you can do that integral. And what you get is m is g, no surprise, uh, mt over 2 pi to the 3 halves. That's not so important. So this gets the dimensions right. So m times t uh, to the 3 halves has energy cubed for number density. And the most important thing about it is there's an e to the minus m times t. So the number density for a gas of non-relativistic, so massive particles, when the temperature is smaller than the mass, has an exponential suppression in the number density. So this is very important because early on the number of bosons is the temperature cubed when the temperature has cooled below the mass of the bosons, um, the number density drops exponentially. So the particles become very, very sparse. And that's always assuming that we're in equilibrium, right? So this is the equilibrium uh, number density. Okay, and for fermions, um, no, um, so bosons and fermions are the same because the exponential here dominates and the energy density rho, uh, well, now we're talking about non-relativistic particles. So the kinetic energy is typically small. The mass is what dominates. So the energy density is just a mass times the number density in that limit. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> That's the basic, uh, 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 some of the basic quantities that we're gonna need. And now I want to apply um, this to our universe. So this was just uh, statistical physics stuff, right? Um, this is true whether you have an expanding universe or just a gas of particles in a box, it doesn't matter. And uh, so now I wanna um, apply this to the standard model in the universe. And in particular, we want to talk about the standard model energy density in our universe at early times when the standard model particles were in uh, kinetic and chemical equilibrium. <clears throat> yeah, there's another question here when you have a second. Yeah. Uh, when, it's, when it's in the relativistic limit, we always have T roughly uh, one over A since number density is conserved, but for the non-relativistic limit, people seem to use T goes as one over A squared for practical use. Can you explain why? Um, so, yeah, so what, what we know is that the momentum, which is a wave, uh, one over a wavelength, the momentum goes like one over A. And so in the relative, and, and the momentum for a relativistic particle uh, the momentum is equal to the kinetic energy, which is equal to the, which is the, by definition, the temperature. So for a relativistic particle, you see from this already T as P is goes like one over A. Now P always goes like one over A. And for a non-relativistic particle, the energy uh, is M plus P squared over two M. This is the kinetic energy uh, so this is what sets the temperature. As you see, it goes like P squared. And so uh, it goes like one over A squared. So that's why the temperature of a non-relativistic gas in equilibrium uh, scales like one over A squared. And so if you have some non-relativistic particles that are not exchanging kinetic energy with some relativistic particles, so some photons here and some completely decoupled dark matter, 
the dark matter, uh, if it's non-relativistic, its temperature will drop like one over a squared, whereas the photon temperature drops like one over a. So at later times, the dark matter is much, much colder than the photons. It's an important ingredient of uh, understanding why cold dark matter is, is cold. Okay, <clears throat> so the standard <clears throat> model energy density in relativistic particles. So <clears throat> one uh, basic thing you can see here, if we're looking at the energy density of all the standard model particles, uh, it'll have at some temperature, there'll be some particles that are relativistic, some particles that are non-relativistic. The relativistic ones have an energy density, where am I? Um, oh, I forgot to write that down. Relativistic energy density, rho boson, uh, sorry about that, should be I squared um, over 30, uh, G T to the fourth, and for a fermion, rho fermion, we get seven eighths times uh, rho boson. So more or less the same, but so the important piece is it's uh, the energy density goes like T to the fourth for relativistic particles. For non-relativistic particles, it has an E to the minus M over T in it. So this is always much, much smaller when these things are in equilibrium than uh, those things. And so if you wanna add up all the energy densities in the standard model, um, assuming things are in, in uh, equilibrium and the chemical potential is zero, um, you only need to sum the relativistic particles because the non-relativistic ones are exponentially small. So if we now add up the standard model energy density in relativistic particles, um, <clears throat> that depends on what temperature we are. Uh, which particles are relativistic and which ones are not. So we should always only include the ones that are relativistic. So at very, very high temperatures, when all the particles in the standard model are relativistic, including top quarks, so temperatures well above the top quark mass, all we got to do is we take the energy density in all the bosons and the energy density in all the fermions, add that all up, and that's it. And this is just T to the fourth, the temperature of the standard model at that time. The G's are these things that count how many colors and spins of the, the, the individual particles have, and then you can multiply by the right pi's, and that's it. So we can actually say how much energy is in the standard model particles early in the universe when the universe had a certain temperature. <clears throat> so uh, let me introduce some notation for that. So this is rho radiation. Uh, in the standard model is, uh, there's some overall normalization that one usually writes, which is no surprise, comes from there, pi squared over 30. <clears throat> then there's a T gamma to the fourth. This is the temperature of the photons to the fourth. But if everybody's in equilibrium, this is the temperature of everybody to the fourth. And then one writes it as a G star uh, standard model where um, this is suggestive of that G here. And this G star here is a sum over all the Gs. So one wants to write one formula with one T to the fourth, and then all the different particles of the standard model contribute to this G star. So if there was only one standard model particle, this G would be exactly the G of that particle. If you have two of them, it's the sum of the Gs of the different particles. So let me write that. For you. So uh, G star standard model is, so I'll drop the standard model when it's obvious what I'm talking about, is the sum over the relativistic bosons uh, times the GI, so the G for every one of those bosons. So I'm summing over all the bosons I and GI. So this includes the photon, this includes uh, the other gauge bosons, the Higgs. And here I want to generalize a little bit. So if you happen to have that some of the particles are relativistic, but they're at a different temperature from the photons, then we need to put in a factor of Ti 
So the temperature of that boson over the temperature of the photons. You see every particle, relativistic particle contributes with a T to the fourth. So if the T's of different particles are different, then um, <clears throat> this factor here just takes that into account. Now, of course, fermions also contribute. So we also should be summing over fermions and their G's. And again, if it happens to be that the temperature of a fermion is different, but it's still in thermal equilibrium, then we can generalize our formula in this way. Uh, and <clears throat> note fermions have a 7 8 in their energy density, so there's an extra 7 8 here in the sum over fermions. Hey, there's a question. Uh, is this before the electroweak phase transition? This is at any time. So it's at a time when, um, so before the electroweak phase transition, the Higgs vacuum expectation value would be zero. So, and you pick whatever temperature you want to consider before the electroweak phase transition. So for example, TeV temperatures, then you should be looking which standard model particles are lighter than a TeV. Those are the ones that are included in the sum and you need to sum over all those particles. If you're below the electroweak phase transitions, you know what the particle's masses are. Whichever one is still relativistic, you're including here. So this is G star here, uh, from what I just said, should be clear is a function of time. Because which, which bosons I'm summing over here and which fermions I'm summing here uh, is a function of time. Now, usually when everybody's in equilibrium with everybody, these T's here just drop out because they're all the same. And so this is just a sum over a bunch of numbers, but those numbers change as we go through the mass thresholds, as the temperature cools through the mass thresholds. Um, and then another question about the subscripts on the temperatures. Um, what is TF um, and should it be T sub gamma? Uh, which, uh, which fermion oh, does T sub gamma? Uh, yeah, that was a brain fart of mine. Uh, so this should be a T gamma um, to cancel out that T gamma if my fermion happens to have a different temperature. Sorry about that. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so um, I told you this is now easy to do. We can just sum over all of these numbers. And in fact, in the standard model, uh, let me write the answer for you. But I'll leave this as a very nice exercise actually to do this, uh, to derive what is the sum of all these Gs in the standard model um, if we're say, uh, a temperature is much larger than the top mass. So then we should be including all of the particles as relativistic particles. And then you get G star is equal to 106.75. 7 eighths here is why you get crooked numbers. <clears throat> so I'll leave this as an exercise. Uh, check this. This is a fun thing to do. It allows you to remember what the quantum numbers of the standard model are because you've got a sum over how many colors there are and things like that. And uh, at temperatures of less than the electron mass, so relatively low temperatures, you can show that G star is equal to 3.36. And this is interesting. So this is not a crooked number that you can get from 7 eighths. This actually below the electron mass. Uh, so that's below an MeV. Below an MeV, the neutrinos, so now we have no more relativistic electrons anymore, right? Because we're below the electron mass. So the only thing we're summing over are neutrinos and photons. And the neutrinos below an MeV actually have a slightly different temperature from the photons. And so you've got to really use these TIs here to derive that. And I'm going to ask you to do the opposite. So assuming that G star is 3.36, say somebody told you that, uh, what is, so the, the exercise is fine, uh, what is the ratio of the neutrino temperature over the photon temperature such that that is true? And that will actually be the temperature of the neutrinos uh, at temperatures 
um, um, below the electron mass. And before the neutrinos become non relativistic. Okay, so two fun exercises to do. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let me talk about uh, during, so early on in the universe, the energy densities of the standard model are mostly in radiation, as I've explained here, because of this exponential factor. And so early in the universe, the universe is radiation dominated. And uh, <clears throat> so in radiation domination, remember we had this formula for the Hubble expansion rate. Hubble was the energy sum over all the energy densities. And now we're just summing over the radiation because we're dominated by the radiation over three and Planck square <clears throat> square root. I've written the formula for Hubble squared, so that's where the square root is from. And if we just plug in for our formula for what the radiation is in the standard model, the most important thing here is to t to the fourth, and then there's the one over and Planck here. So this, uh, I'm dropping the threes and the pi's, uh, gives you approximately t photon squared over uh, n Planck. And uh, exercise for you, get the pi's and the g's. Right, uh, in my notes, I have those. Okay, so this is also an important result because we're going to be looking at the expansion rate of the universe sort of as a, a, as a, a rate to compare to. So this is a rate of how quickly are things being torn apart by the expansion of the universe. And that goes like T squared over N Planck. And we're gonna be comparing that to other rates like scattering rates of particles. So there are actually two questions about uh, uh, quarks and gluons contributing to G star. Absolutely, they contribute, but that's your exercise to do that here. No, no, no. He, he, they're asking about quarks and gluons. Yeah, how do you and and do gluons remain massless uh, uh, throughout uh, things like that? Uh, do gluons remain massless? I don't think so. Right, there are no massless gluons um, that we observe in experiments. Only if we're doing experiments where the proton mass is negligible at high energy colliders, does it seem like the gluon mass is zero? So no, gluons, if our temperature is below the confinement scale, there's no such thing as gluons. It's the real standard model. So you've got to know, put in everything you, you know about the standard model uh, to do this. Okay, um, so I had promised um, that I would cover the uh, freeze out calculation uh, in this lecture. And it looks like I'm not covering the freeze out calculation. Um, that is two more pages of my notes. So what I will do is I will write the answer of the, no, that doesn't make any sense, right? Um, so yeah, maybe I will, I will uh, just apologize that I didn't do that. And uh, I'll talk about it a little bit. Uh, so what I, what I want to talk about next actually is entropy, because uh, that's one of the important concepts, but I'll move that to the next lecture. And uh, we'll talk just briefly about how WIMP freeze out works. what the idea of it is. And uh, so the idea is that we have our dark matter particles, a chi and say a chi bar, maybe a particle antiparticle, but they could be the same thing. Could be a Majorana particle, um, or it could be a scalar, a real scalar. Um, and they interact with the standard model in some way. And so <clears throat> early on, we assume that the rate of this process is very fast. And I'm also going to assume that the number density of chi's and the chi bars is the same, uh, so that there's no asymmetry between those two things, uh, or no chemical potential, uh, more specifically for the chi's. And uh, early on in the universe, we have rapid interactions that go this way and that way. 
And so both kinetic energy and number densities are being equilibrated. And so our formulas that we just wrote here, the equilibrium formulas are true for the number density of the dark matter particles, as well as for the standard model particles. Um, so that's the early situation. Let me draw uh, temperature uh, plot here. So at high temperatures, and the important things here are the mass of the chi. That's an important dividing line. So at high temperatures, we have the standard model plus chi in equilibrium. Right? Um, what that means is the number density of chi's is, well, if it's in equilibrium, we know that the number density of chi's scales like T cubed. More precisely, it has some pi's out front and a G for chi and then T cubed, which we know by dimensional analysis. <clears throat> so let's say the temperature, we're starting at high temperatures, we're cooling the universe, the number density of dark matter particles scales like T cubed, which you recognize as just one over volume, so they're diluted by the volume. Um, they interact back and forth with the standard model. Everybody dilutes like the volume. Then we pass through the mass threshold of the, uh, of the dark matter, and the dark matter now becomes non-relativistic. And you can see here what that means is that the number density of dark matter particles starts to drop and drops faster and faster. So in terms of our process here, how could it be dropping the number density very fast? Well, very clearly we have this uh, in equilibrium. We now have energies that are typically smaller than the dark matter masses. So now it's favorable for this interaction to be shifting in that direction and we get more annihilations than we get productions. <clears throat> At temperatures much lower than the dark matter mass, the standard model particles typically don't have enough energy anymore to produce dark matter particles. So at the microscopic level, this process here is what gives rise to this exponential decay in the number density of particles. So as we're going from higher than n chi to lower than n chi temperatures, <clears throat> we have chi annihilation. That's what that process here does for us. And down here, the number density of chi particles is, well, there's this prefactor, which is not the important thing. The e to the minus m over t is the important thing because this drops much faster than any power of t. So when we get to this point, uh, at some point here below the mass, the number density of chi particles has now become so small that it becomes impossible for the chi particles to find each other. Or from the perspective of, say, this high antiparticle here, it's traveling through the universe and it's trying to annihilate with chi particles, but the number density of the chi particles is exponentially small. Basically, there aren't any chi particles anymore. So the rate for this particle to be finding one of those particles to annihilate with uh, is exponentially suppressed. And <clears throat> at some point, it's so small that you just never find a particle anymore. Remember, at the same time, the expansion rate of the universe is still going on. So the universe is expanding. So if you don't find a particle in the next second, you're certainly not going to find one after the universe is expanded and the particles are more and more diluted. So at some point, and it's actually because this is an exponential, it's pretty soon after we get to what's called the freeze out temperature, T freeze out, <clears throat> after which um, at which point the annihilation stops. Because the particles, the dark matter particles, just don't find it, their partners to annihilate with anymore. So the number density of particles drops very quickly in this regime here, and then um, pretty soon after, so this is typically a factor of 10 or so below, the mass of the particle, uh, the annihilation stop, even if you had a very large cross-section for the scattering process initially. Now, because it's multiplied by this very small number density, uh, the annihilation stop. 
And the leftover number density of particles you have in chi is exactly the number density that it was when you stopped. So the leftover number density of dark matter particles is given by this formula here. Well, the leftover energy density of particles, dark matter particles, is given by that formula times m. So that's the idea of the freeze-out calculation. You follow the universe, uh, the, uh, the cooling, through the threshold of the mass of the dark matter particle. Uh, then the number density of the dark matter particles drops exponentially. <clears throat> and at some point, uh, this process here becomes too slow to keep up with the expansion rate of the universe. So we're gonna be comparing this process here to the expansion rate of the universe, the rate of this process to the expansion rate of the universe. And when that happens, uh, then this, this uh, annihilation of dark matter particles stops. And then you know exactly what the number density of the dark matter particles is at that time. And then afterwards, there are no more interactions with the dark matter particles. They never scatter anymore. And after that, the number density just scales like uh, uh, one over the volume again. So that's the idea of the freeze-out calculation. And uh, you know, I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop here. So we'll start uh, with that uh, with the next lecture. But uh, that's the idea. And uh, very briefly connecting that to indirect detection, what you're gonna learn about in the next lecture is, you know, Early on at this time here, there's a rapid annihilation of the dark matter particles when we're right around the threshold here so that the number density drops exponentially. So very, very many annihilations into standard model particles. But, and then I said, okay, then after we've, the number density is diluted exponentially, the dark matter particles never find anybody to annihilate with anymore. That's actually not exactly true. Of course, there's still a lot of dark matter particles and every once in a while, one of them will find another one to annihilate with and produce a standard model of particles. That's a wonderful signature uh, of the dark matter that you could look for. You could look out in the sky and try to see, uh, do you see these standard model particles from dark matter annihilations? And as you will learn, in areas where the dark matter density today is higher than the average dark matter density, <clears throat> for example, at the center of the galaxy, um, this process, of course, so it's easier in such places for dark matter to find somebody to annihilate with. And so, uh, so you might still be able to see this process today, which is uh, the, the very exciting topic of indirect uh, dark matter detection. Okay, so to do the calculation, um, we'll have to wait until next time. I had written down what the answer is, but I don't, I think you'll get the answer in the next lecture anyways. So All that's right. for today. Thank you, yeah. So I don't see any last minute questions. So we should all stand up and stretch and walk around a little bit before the next lecture, which is in about 20 minutes. And uh, I will see you then. So thanks, Martin.